so I came across a probability problem, originally invented by another YouTuber, where this sequence of fractions comes up. It starts out very simply, a half, zero quarters, one eighth, one sixteenth, but then things get exciting when you realize the pattern. Two thirty seconds, three sixty fourths, five one twenty eighths. These are the Fibonacci numbers in the numerators, so these are always the Fibonacci numbers on top, and the bottom is always a power of two. And not only that, these fractions are actually a probability distribution, which means if you add them all up, it adds up to exactly one. And in the original video, they were just calculating a few of these numbers, and I don't think they saw the pattern of the Fibonacci numbers appearing. So what I'd like to do is show you the problem and explain it from a kind of a different point of view that explains why the Fibonacci numbers come up. So what is this problem and why are the Fibonacci numbers here? Well, it's a very simple sounding problem. There's a spider who lives on a pentagon and he goes for a random walk. So what he does is he looks at the two possible places he could step and he takes a step in one of those two directions completely at random. So you can imagine this little spider, he's flipping a coin and he's walking around and around. And we're going to let capital T be the amount of time he spends on his walk before he gets home. And to really emphasize what's going on here, I'm going to add the word first, his first return home. So he's going to walk around for some amount of time, and at some point he's going to step back on his house, and then we're going to say his walk is over, and he's just going to spend the rest of eternity uh, living at his house, enjoying his life, eating flies, and having tea. So t is a random variable, because he's going to spend a random amount of time walking around before he ends up at home. What is the distribution of t? Well, it turns out it's exactly these numbers. So if you wait for the spider to get back to his house, and you ask, what is the probability it took him exactly some number of steps? It's exactly this sequence of fractions. So as an example, if you ask what is the probability that he gets back home in exactly two steps, the answer is exactly one half. There are two different ways he can get home in two steps. He can either go out and back immediately on the left or out and back immediately on the right. So that is a one quarter chance, a half times a half for the left situation, plus a one quarter chance, a half times a half on the right situation, which is exactly one half. If you ask what is the probability he gets home in three steps, the answer is zero. There is no way that the spider can leave his house and come back in exactly three steps, just by the geometry of the picture. And if you ask what is the chance he will get home in exactly four steps, it's going to be one eighth. The probability t equals four. Well, he can go out and back on the left again and on the right again uh, for t equals four. And you're going to get a, a one sixteenth plus a one sixteenth equals one eighth for the probability t equals four. Now those ones are simple because it's sort of either on the left or on the right, but as you get to higher and higher values, like what is the probability he will take exactly eight steps, it's going to be a complicated path with a lot of lefts and rights, and at first it's not easy to see how you would count the number of possible paths like this, but it's going to turn out that they're the Fibonacci numbers. So as a formula, you would write this as the probability that t equals n for some value of n, it's the n minus third Fibonacci number, so f here is for Fibonacci, divided by the appropriate power of two, and it's two to the n minus one. Uh, the reason it's two to the n minus one, well, there's two to the n ways the coin flips could come up in his first n steps of his walk, and then there's the symmetry with the left and the right that we've seen that is uh, sort of eliminating a power of two. So the fun thing to see is why the Fibonacci numbers come up for the number of paths that are here. I do want to point out one other thing that we're going to see along the way. Not only are the individual probabilities these Fibonacci numbers, but the cumulative probability distribution is also a Fibonacci number. So if you ask, what is the probability Mr. Spider is still walking at time n, so that his walk is some amount of time greater than n, the answer is also a Fibonacci number. And this, in this case, it's the nth Fibonacci number. Okay, so this is what we're trying to show, that Mr. Spider has Fibonacci probabilities to end up back at his house for the first time. Let's see why it is. And what we're going to do is we're going to unfold the pentagon so that he's walking on a straight line. So take the pentagon here and kind of unfold it and imagine it as a straight line with five positions he could be at. And what we've done here, because we've unfolded the pentagon, there are two positions that correspond to his house. There's the place where he started, but also on the far end, that's another sort of copy of his house. And we sort of think of him walking around, we just think about how far into his trip he is. So and now when he walks around, um, if he's at the house, he has to step into the interior of the pentagon. But in the middle here, he's again doing random walks where he's stepping left and right. So it's just a, another way to think about walking on the pentagon as walking either left or right on a straight line. And this brings us into some classical probability territory. This is a random walk with two definite endpoints on a fixed length interval, which is a really well studied problem. And you can write down a Markov chain matrix for it and all these other things. Um, but to see what's going on, all you have to do is add a dimension here. So think of this dimension as space. If you add a time dimension, you'll immediately see what's going on. And to make that convenient, I've drawn this 
vertically. So I'm drawing the spider's position as sort of a Y coordinate, how far up or down he is. And we're gonna take Mr. Spider here, put him back where he started, and add a time component here on the X axis. So this X axis, we're gonna think of as the number of steps into his walk, one step, two steps, three steps, and so on. And inside this little grid that we've made, we are going to draw the number of ways Mr. Spider can walk from his starting position over here to some other situation. So as an example, at time four, this represents time t equals four, lowercase t equals four, Mr. Spider can have two different ways to get to the position y equals two. What are the two different ways? Well, he could either go up, 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 down. That's one way. And again, if you draw it sort of vertically like this, it's hard to see what's going on, but if you draw it with a time direction, then it looks a lot nicer. So it's up, 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 down. So that's a one way Mr. Spider can get to y equals two at time t equals four. And another way is like this. He could go uh, up, up, down, up. And that looks like this, up, up, down, up. And those are the two different ways he can get to this position. And that's why we're gonna draw a number two in this spot. And filling in this grid like this is going to let us see the Fibonacci numbers and where they come from. I do want to emphasize one other thing. This is the number of ways to get to a given square without going home first. So remember, if Mr. Spider goes back to his house, he stops his walk and he st stays there. So one sort of non-path that you could imagine is going like this, up, down. And at this point, there's no way he's going to get to the position y equals two at t equals four because he has reached his house back where he started. And so he's going to stop there. This is the difficulty of the problem is that we're stopping the random walk when he gets back to his house. That's what makes it interesting, and that's what's going to make the Fibonacci numbers appear. Okay, so now all we got to do is fill in this grid with all these different ways, and the probabilities of the length of his walk are going to appear. And if we tried to fill it in like this by drawing all these different paths, we would be here all day. Uh, the, the beautiful thing is that you don't have to do that. There is a simpler way to figure out these numbers. So let's start at the very beginning and see what's going on. So here's Mr. Spider at time zero. He starts at the very bottom at the lowest position, y equals zero. And the only thing he can do is move up. So at time one, we draw a one at the position y equals one to represent this one way of moving up. And we've drawn this little up arrow over here to represent him moving up. Now at the next time at t equals two, we're gonna see that what happened at time t equals one sort of splits itself into two copies. So there's one up arrow and one down arrow. And this represents the fact that Anything you did up to time t equals one, once you're there, you have two choices. You can either go up or down after that. And so all the paths at time t equals one, okay, there's only one of them, it splits into two different paths going up and down at time t equals two. At time t equals three, this is where you can make your first mistake. So if you're not careful, you will accidentally draw an arrow going this way. But remember, uh, this bottom position represents his house. And then once he's at his house, he doesn't leave anymore. And so don't draw that arrow. And what that means is times t equals three looks like this. So just the one splits into two up above. Now at time t equals four, something exciting is gonna happen because by using the same splitting rule of thinking of these ones as splitting off into two copies of themselves, we're gonna see there's gonna be a collision in this square and the things are going to add together. Let's see what that looks like. So boom, they combine together and add to give two. And this two combining represents the fact that there are two different ways to get to this square. You can either get there from above at the previous time or from below at the previous time. So you can either have a down arrow or an up arrow, they add together. Some people call this the adding rule for combinatorics or the adding rule for probability. And it just says, when you have two different ways things can happen, you gotta add them together. And this kind of, at some level, is the reason this method works so well, is we only have to keep track of the number of paths at every given location and use these adding rules to figure out the number of paths in the next location. We don't need to figure out the details of the path. Did it go up? Did it go down? Once we know that there are two paths here and one path here, we will automatically be able to figure out that there must be three paths in the next spot because one plus two equals three. We don't need to worry about, did it go up? Did it go down? We just count the number. And this counting rule will work forever. So now we have a two and a three, which will combine to give us the number five in the next spot. Uh, notice by the way, at the top here, uh, this up, 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 up represents the one way that Mr. Spider can go all the way around the Pentagon in five steps. So once he's back here at his house, he is not going to step anymore. There are no more steps that leave from that one. Now we have a situation at time t equals six with two, five, and three ways to get to those three spots. And that's gonna lead us to seeing that at time t equals seven, the number of ways is five, eight, and three. And now our Fibonacci brain is turning on. You'll notice that three, five, and eight are three consecutive Fibonacci numbers. 
and that pattern will continue. So in the next column, it will also be three consecutive Fibonacci numbers. It's the numbers of five, eight, and 13. So the pattern seems to be that the lowest numbered Fibonacci number is at the edge. So either at the top here on odd numbered times like t equals seven, or at the bottom here on even numbered times like t equals eight. And once you know the, where the lowest Fibonacci number is, the next Fibonacci number is the furthest away, and the biggest Fibonacci number is in the middle. So let's see if that pattern continues one more time. And indeed it does. Now we have eight, 13, and 21. So we always have three consecutive Fibonacci numbers in every column, um, starting everything, actually we look back, starting here in column T equals four, everything past that is always these three consecutive Fibonacci numbers arranged in this specific way. And if you believe this fact that there's always Fibonacci numbers in all the columns, you can see why the probability for the spider to finish his trip in exactly n steps must be a Fibonacci number. The number of ways he can finish his trip in exactly n steps is exactly the number um, in this bottom most column and in these top most columns. So those are the numbers. And if the numbers in every column are Fibonacci numbers, then these are Fibonacci numbers as well. So at time t equals two, there's one way, then zero ways, then one way, then one way, then two ways, then three ways, and then five ways, then eight ways. Those are the ways he can finish his walk in those specific number of times. Okay, you might say, okay, we've noticed this pattern up to time t equals nine, but is the pattern actually true forever? Like, is it always gonna be the Fibonacci numbers or is it just a coincidence here in the first few numbers? And the way I would think about it is to think of these Fibonacci numbers as sort of a self-propagating cycle. So once it's the Fibonacci numbers, it's actually going to cause it to be the Fibonacci numbers in the next situation. So in general, here after time t equals nine, what's going to happen is we're gonna have a situation like this, where at time t equals n, we're gonna have the three Fibonacci numbers, the n minus third Fibonacci number is going to be on the far edge, then the n minus second Fibonacci number, one up from that, is going to be on the opposite side, and the biggest Fibonacci number, fn minus one, is going to be in the middle there. And that is exactly what we saw on these earlier times. So this pattern of three consecutive Fibonacci numbers, smallest Fibonacci number on the outside, is exactly what we saw earlier on. And if that is true at time t equals n, then what's going to happen is at time t equals n plus one, when we apply the rule, we're going to see these Fibonacci numbers adding together. So let's see what that looks like. The Fibonacci numbers fn minus one and fn minus two, they add together, and it is a well-known property, the defining property, if you will, of the Fibonacci numbers. They add together to give the next Fibonacci number fn. We're also gonna have the Fibonacci numbers fn minus two and fn minus one, they sort of copy themselves over into these other situations. And now we are back in a situation where we have the three consecutive Fibonacci numbers with the smallest one on the outside. So the smallest one is now fn minus two, and then fn minus one, and then fn. So if we are in a situation where we have the three consecutive Fibonacci numbers, then in the next situation, we will still be in that situation with the three consecutive Fibonacci numbers. And if you want, you can even index this perfectly by replacing those n's and n minus ones by thinking of them in terms of n plus one, which is now the current time. And what we've done is we've basically set up a proof by induction of a very specific claim, which is that the number of ways in our grid at time n are the three Fibonacci numbers, fn minus three, fn minus one, and fn minus two, starting from the outside and, and working in, and we've proven it by induction. So we've shown that if it happens to be true at time t equals n, then it automatically will be true at time t equals n plus one, and this will, like dominoes, prove it for all possible n's. Uh, I guess it's also important you do the base case, which we did as well. So this explains why the Fibonacci numbers are in this problem, and if you know this number of ways are Fibonacci numbers, you can convert it into probabilities by just dividing by the right power of two. So for example, the chance that the spider ends his walk exactly at time t equals n, that is exactly the smallest of the three Fibonacci numbers, fn minus three. You have to divide by two to the n minus one because there are two choices for ups and downs in each of these steps, except for there's an exception, which is the very first step only has one choice. So in the original problem on the Pentagon, he could go left or right, but the way we've drawn it, he can only go up at the beginning. And that's why it's a two to the n minus one. The other fun corollary that I promised you is that the cumulative distribution will also be a Fibonacci number. So what is the chance that he's still walking at time t greater than n? Well, that at time n, how could he still be walking? Well, he has to be somewhere in the middle. So if he hasn't finished the walk before that, and he hasn't finished exactly at time t equals n, at time t equals n, he must be in one of these two situations. And there's fn minus one and fn minus two ways he can be in the two pos potential positions in the interior of the pentagon at time n. So the answer is fn minus one plus fn minus two. But of course, because these are Fibonacci numbers, that adds up to Fn. 
So the chance he is still walking around at time end is also a Fibonacci number. So for example, at time t equals nine, there's 21 plus 13 equals 34 ways he could still be out for his walk after nine steps. And if you like this kind of problem and you're looking for even more fun math puzzles, there's no better place to go than the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Thousands of interactive lessons are waiting for you in Brilliant's extensive catalog. Their topics span everything from math to science to programming and AI. They've got problems to try out no matter what you're interested in. And the Brilliant app lets you bring it all with you wherever you go. They've got quick activities you can try whenever you've got time. In just minutes, you can dive into a new topic or stretch your brain with a new way to think about something you've already seen. By using Brilliant, you'll build a habit that helps you get a little bit smarter every day. It's the one app on your phone that's the opposite of mindless scrolling. You'll develop your mathematical intuition and fluency with visuals that bring the math to life. To try everything Brilliant has to offer, free for a full 30 days, visit the link in the video description or scan the QR code here. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video.